episode 59, boys, of the Racing Line podcast. Here, the night after the um, Brazilian Grand Prix. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah, trying to start with something optimistic, right? Let's get the energy up. Yeah, Whoa. yeah. Welcome to the 59th episode, guys. Um, pretty simple week because we just had a um, Formula One race to talk about which is the bread and butter of the pod, which is good. Um, we've got the triangle back, the triarch. Um, the triangle. The triangle, mate. Everything in threes. Um, the python. Some, some, would, some would call it the threesome. Some would. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, but some would. Anyway, um, it's good to have you both on. It's good to see good you. Good to have you back. We've always been here. Yep. I just thought, I'd, yeah, yeah. Let's best try. race of the it's year. Be, you reckon? I think so. I think it was one of the well, best races of the year. I want to start with something different. Just let's spice it up a little bit. If you had one statement to define this race for you personally, both of you, what would it be? Oh. This is a good way to start. I'll start just to fill the, fill the time and to give you a bit more time to consider for me personally death to drs <laughs> and hopefully death we can to talk. drs yeah yeah why is that was why my, is that? that that was my key takeaway I, I i'll be honest i only watched the mini but the minis all the good bits and what is i saw like from three minutes that's like 25 oh, minutes what is, oh, is it? oh this is what i did see though i saw all the crashes at the beginning which made it super engaging and apart from that, all the overtaking was on the main straight. And yeah, but it wasn't though. David all the Croft, important ones were David on the Croft main straight. David Croft was getting was getting super excited about um, every single one of those overtakes with some really high energy vocals, and yet they were kind of done two hundred meters before the first corner. And I was like, really? But yeah, I like the Lando about British drivers. I like the Lando incident. I like the Ricardo incident. I think Magnussen could have kept that car straight, decided to turn it into Ricardo. That's probably a conversation for tonight. Um, Verstappen, a bit silly, but he's won the championship, so he's just he's just all out there. I think Hamilton, in Verstappen's defence, knew that Max was there, and while technically he had the right to that next corner, if he like by him doing what he did. I don't know what he expected the outcome was going to be. It was literally Monza all over again, um, which is interesting. But that was that's my that was my key thing from watching that it was death to DRS. I think it doesn't really need to be there anymore. But apart from that, the track was great. The weather was great. I just loved watching them race on a classic track um, with a bit of history, with a bit of I don't know variety compared to a lot of the tracks that we see now. Um, but yeah, that was my takeaway. When you say death to DRS, are you yeah. envisaging that overtakes happen elsewhere? Because at the moment they're, um, they're just waiting for the main straight. To, to, to yeah, well, listen, DRS can, like, the way that it is being used now, the way that it's being deployed now needs to change because what we are seeing is just and if you're a driver and you don't want to have a crash, like trying to risk a move, why would you want to, like, for example, we saw three potential overtakes outside of the DRS zone in this race. Every single one of them ruined the race in some regard for the people that were involved. So why would you make those risks? So the way they deploy the DRS, and we've spoken about it ad nauseum this season about kind of giving them like a time certain amount of time per race to use the advantage, whatever it might be, just to get a bit more diversity into how it's deployed. And I think the, the biggest thing is the optics because um, like in Netflix, it's really easy to splice a sequence of overtakes and to make it look super engaging. But I think if you're watching a race for two hours and you, and like we're lucky because we're kind of drawn to the sport 
historically and intrinsically, but if you're not and you just see the same move for two hours, I don't think it's going to give you the same level of excitement after 90 minutes. Um, so I think the way that it's deployed has to be rigid. I'm, I'm kind of with Joey, though. I thought it was a great race. I thought there was heaps happening. Um, the whole Red Bull debacle, which has exploded afterwards, which is excellent. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the I know it was yesterday, but the Alonso and Ocon little inter-team inter battle, which was great. Like, I think there's been some great racing this whole weekend, and it's not just um, DRS overtaking on the main straight, which I think, admittedly, there is a lot of that, but yeah, it's not just that. I think this weekend was the best probably Formula One package we've seen all year in terms of the fact that we got the Haas on pole, which is amazing. Mm. You know, that's what you want from qualifying. Mm. The sprint the sprint race then probably was the most engaging sprint race we've had mm -hmm. um, in terms of just overtaking and then just the way that it, it spiced up the starting order for the race. And then having a couple incidents at the start of the race, you mentioned Ocon and Alonso's thing. We also had Stroll and um, Vettel's thing in the sprint race, which was which was also quite interesting. Um, and then just, I think as well, the fact that the Mercedes was the best car this weekend. Um, and we could tell mm. that, well, from, from the sprint race, I was, I was surprised. Um, I'm happy that we had a sprint race though, because then my, um, my predictions for the actual race looked like I was a Oracle. Um, I'm telling you, I feel like sometimes I'm the smartest guy in this group, but I just don't get the plaudits that I need. And when I make I mean, these, we, we, we always did you, did you, tell you did you, how did you see my predictions? Did you see my prediction? You picked no. all five, but Anthony didn't. You know, Anthony didn't see it. I said Russell to win, Hamilton to come, Hamilton to come second, Sainz, and then um, what's his name, Charles, Verstappen. and oh, then Charles. Verstappen fucked me up. But other than that, I was I was I was right on point. Yeah, no one's ever got it like that in, in our predictions. I got it. I got. You got five out of five, but if Verstappen. I've done a five for five motor GP, I'm sure. What was that, Harry? If Verstappen didn't be the dog that he was, you wouldn't have got five for five. Nah, he wouldn't have. That's the thing this weekend that I think I love the most. This weekend, it was clearly evident that um, the Mercedes was the best car this weekend. And I think Ferrari and. Red Bull had a little bit of, you know, uh, give and take. I feel like Checo was sort of hung out to dry on his tyre strategy at the end of the race. I mean, it is what it is. Um, but um, for me, Mercedes gets a win. I've been, I've been saying I think it's important that it happens sometime before the end of the year. That's happened. That's really spiced things up in terms of the second place in the championship as well. Um, for me... Per I think this was the best weekend of um, Formula One this year, including the fact that there was a sprint race and it was a good sprint race. It was a good qualifying session and a great race as well. Yes, the the, the DRS problem is a problem and we've sort of discussed that at, at Nauseam on here, but it's not going to change this year. So sort of putting that aside, I feel like this weekend was probably the best. Um, the issue is... Like I agree that there's a, there are some things that like have spiced up the weekend, right? But how often are you going? Are we going to get like a wet and changing qualifying that spices up that a race that has really more clumsy moves? Um, but I don't think they're clumsy the, moves. Well, I think they, it was just well, people putting their elbows out. Like the the Max, the Max and um, Lewis one, I think was just. Two drivers. Yeah. Okay. So if, if Lewis is still right fighting, away. yeah. If if Lewis, for example, if Hamilton, if this happens to fighting for the championship, does he put his car there? Probably not. I think there was a level of reckless abandon because he had already finished off the championship. The Ricardo move. I mean, I don't know why he got given the penalty that he was like. He just clipped him like at, on the first lap. It seemed like the Haas checked up a little bit as well, and he obviously didn't get an advantage because. He was out of the race as well. So for them to give him a penalty, I thought was a little bit harsh. The um, Alpine Rectric 
I did find a little bit interesting. We've been waiting for that relationship to to simmer and or to boil over for quite some time, and it finally seems to be like Alonso's had enough of it. Um, but really, I don't know if you're going to get the perfect storm of all those little niggling things happening week in and week out. And and the reason why I had the take that I did is because, yes, in a perfect storm, you can have these things. You can probably say that the nature of the track also contributed somewhat to those mistakes. And that is probably some level, there's some level of truth to that as well. But if we have spoken so passionately at times negatively about the um, what's put on display in the championship, then you want more than wishful thinking for these little things to happen in order to have a great race. Um, I just don't want to to be negative about stuff that can't change anymore. I feel like we should try and be a bit more positive when like, like you say, you're not going to have these perfect storms. So when you get it, acknowledge it for what it is and, and, and celebrate the display we had. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. I will, I will, I will take that on board. That is a good point. Of points. I have a couple of points. Firstly, you're pretty quiet H you might want to get closer to that mic. Sorry. Is that better? A little bit. Cup, couple of points. Um, Mercedes being back mm. 100% means that next year we're at least going to have a two six cars. Mm. But I think Ferrari looked quite strong. Like, well, Carlos did. Carlos looked really strong this weekend. So if you've got, and I think we saw a bit of a chink in Red Bull's armor today because they had Mercedes fighting up against them. Mm. Whatever happened with Max, it is what it is. But Perez, I think out of the six drivers in those three teams is the weakest. Right, so I think that team next year, if Max is battling on his own, and there's Russell who looked phenomenal today, won the won his first race, pulled out two or three seconds in the first stint over the, on the fastest car on the grid all year, like mm. f- phenomenal drive. Carlos was on fire. I think he made like three or four pit stops, and he still finished on the podium. Hamilton um, looked great. Have to give him that. Hamilton, Hamilton's back. Like he's been racing really well in the second half of the season. The car's been getting progressively better. So this really excites me going into next year. Um, mm. I think this year we've had, it's been such a long season. And I think it, I think it feels that because Max has been so dominant, we've had so many races where it's just been Max starts on pole, Max wins, nothing's happened. It's boring. But really, if we're getting races like this, we need to, acknowledge how, how good they are when it actually happens. Celebrate. We haven't had many this year. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that, do you think that, because we haven't seen this yet, and what is going to interest me is you've got this trajectory of Mercedes towards the front of the grid. Um, have they got ahead of Ferrari yet? No. They have 19 points now. Okay. Now, if I was them, do you want to finish second and lose out on R and D hours in the in the wind tunnel, or do you want to finish third with this upward trajectory and get a little bit of a jump on Red Bull? Because if you're going from first to second, you, you're losing some level of hours to to first. But if you're finishing third, you're getting a significant increase in wind tunnel time compared to the team that finished first. You so know what some, they remind me of, the and point. they don't need the money. Like they've got the money, they don't have to finish second. For... They remind Sorry. me of Red Bull at the end of twenty twenty, when they finished really strong. They mm. won the last couple of races. I think Max won, whatever he won, probably was Brazil and Abu Dhabi or whatever. And they went into preseason on an upward trajectory, and they came out at the start of last season and were on fire. And I'm hoping. That's where Mercedes is heading. We know as an organisation, they're probably the best on the grid at the end of the day um, over the last 10 years. So, mm. yeah, I, I, I'm really optimistic moving into the next season. Yeah, I hope there's just some convergence at the top. Like if we get three teams that are all genuine contenders, um, you know, within three-tenths of each other in qualifying um, and some level of consistency on tire life, I think we're in for a, hopefully an awesome championship next year. 
Um, and when you've got other young chargers who are able to take it to Hamilton, I think George Russell this year has definitely showed us that, even last year, he's showed us that whenever he's given a chance to perform, whether it's a Williams, whether it's a Mercedes, if he's given half a chance, half a sniff, he'll maximise the, the, the package. Um, I want to give you some pushback, awesome. Harry. Well, I think it was you, Harry, about the, um, you said Red Bull have the weakest driver of the six. And what, what I do believe Checo has probably got the lowest ceiling in terms of like um, out of the six drivers. One thing that I think this year has demonstrated with Checo is um, whereas the Ferrari drivers, I think both of them have demonstrated this numerous times this year is that on the weekends when he's at his worst, he doesn't compound the issues. Like he actually finishes and finishes and brings in points. And if you think about how many points uh, both Ferrari drivers, drivers have left, you know, on the table in terms of causing their own problems, not, not, not even counting team mistakes. Like I think Charles has had two crashes. Um, Sainz has had a lot at the start of the season, not as much at the back end of the season. I think one thing that Checo brings Red Bull is um, just the consistency of a, of a good second driver. Um, like I'm interested to see with Ferrari because at the moment I do believe that um, Charles is slipping from sort of that top spot in the team in the team in terms of just performances. I think I think Carlos has really looked the better of the two in the last probably third of this season. Um, and I'm interested to see how that dynamic goes, like is handled going forward if that sort of continues into next year and to sort of see if they can coexist and work together for the, you know, for the building up of the team. Whereas like you look at Mercedes, the dynamic is very different with Lewis and George because I think that because of the big age difference and sort of Lewis looks at him like a younger brother. Whereas you look at Carlos and Charles, they're the sort of the same age, sort of going for that exact same um, part of their career. And I don't think either of them are the kind of guy to sort of settle for that second driver role. Um, where where George is very, you know, set in sort of being just like a good teammate at the moment. So in terms of the dynamics of the two teams going forward, I don't think Checo is the best like in terms of skills, he's probably is the worst of the six, but in, in what he brings and the consistency he brings, I don't think you can just sort of rate him like that. Yeah, but I, I guess also you've got that Red Bull haven't really had any competition this year other than an inconsistent Ferrari. So if he's got Russell, Hamilton and the two Ferraris consistently challenging him next year, I don't know if he's as consistent. It might surprise me, I'm mm. not saying he can't, but... Mm. At this year, the car's been that much better that he's been able to put in those performances, I feel. With um, what we saw happen to uh, Checo in the inter-battle with Verstappen, um, it's going to be interesting to see how Red Bull deals with it, resolves it. I mean, obviously, as Australians, we are very well-versed in Red Bull inter-team they don't resolve issues, shit. Uh, multi twenty one. Um, however, you you just really isn't... eloquently articulated the value of, of having someone like Sergio Perez in the stable who knows his place, who's going to get, who's going to capitalize on a win whenever it's there for him. But he's also going to definitely play the team game, like we've seen him go long on tires so many times this season um, to have a counter strategy to put pressure on the Ferraris doing everything he can really to be a good player. And then obviously when the opportunity comes for him to win the race or to make something of the race, he's able to capitalize on those moments with what Verstappen or with how Verstappen treated him this week. Does Red Bull have to somewhat re remind Verstappen that it's a team game for no. fear that, for fear that move, well, for fear that next season, if it was to happen again, Checo might not be so compliant with letting him go or being a content second fiddle, uh, or might he no. just try to say, screw you, this is a retaliation from Brazil? If, if Checo knows his place, and I think he does, and I think 
And I think Red Bull is going to do nothing, to be honest, because there's a, a clear two-time world champion and then sort of journeyman driver in their stable. There's a massive difference between the two drivers. Checo probably knows, you know, he's there to be the perfect number two driver, pick up a couple wins a season, win three races, bring in some points, and that's probably as good as it's going to get. And realistically, that's the best season of his career. So knowing his place, I think Checo will not be stupid enough to sort of risk retaliation. Um, will, will Red Bull have a word with Max? They probably will in, for like the optics of it and for the team camaraderie. But do I expect anything to change in the future going forward? Absolutely not. Like there's a guy who's just delivered you two world championships back to back and there's a potential for more coming in the future. You know, just, you just keep feeding him, keep him, you know, keep feeding that hungry boy. You don't, don't worry about sort of that well, other then, stuff. Well, then I'll change the question slightly and I'll come to you, Harry, then. Um, does it reflect poorly on Verstappen? Oh, it does. I think it does. But he's been like this his whole career. Like last year was probably the only year where he wasn't like that. And it was because he was fighting Lewis. He wasn't fighting a teammate. Um, he did it with Danny Rick. He's doing it with Sergio now. My question to you boys is Sergio, if he does what you're saying, Joe, and tells them, you know, in this kind of incident next year, stuff you, I'm just going to do what I want. I didn't say that. He said that. In case, if he does do that, if the rumours are true that Danny Rick's got the Red Bull reserve driver next year, is he looking over his shoulder thinking, shit, I need to play the team game here regardless of whether he wants to or not? You've got an eight-time Grand Prix winner playing reserve driver. I'm not saying Danny Rick's getting the seat. I think he's setting himself up for something else. I don't think he's going back to Red Bull full-time. But I would, think, I would... would you be nervous as Sergio Perez next year? No. I think, I think Perez would rate himself against Ricardo at this stage in their careers purely objectively. Mm. And I think he might have a case. Well, the time next year rolls around, he might have the same amount of rings as Danny Rick anyway, mm. um, which changes everything. Like, if you think about... How many do you got um, now? Four? I think four. Um, I, don't, I don't think um, Danny Rick would realistically we even want that drive if 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 that was the reason that Sergio was one. leaving. I, I don't like if, if that was the re- if that was the reason Sergio was to leave, I think the only person who could take that seat next would be a rookie. 